Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We will start in a few minutes. For today's convenience, our program is translated. Please see the glove icon of translation at the bottom of your screen and select your language of preference. If you have any questions throughout the presentations, please channel them through the Q&A chat and we will address them by the end of the presentations. We will now start this webinar with the opening remarks of Ambassador Jorge Arguello, Argentina Ambassador to the United States. The Zoom is yours, Mr. Ambassador. Muchas, muchas gracias, muchas gracias, Luz. Buenas Thank tardes. Thank you. Thank you, Luz. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me warmly welcome you to this seminar that we are organizing jointly with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Worship of Argentina and the Port of Philadelphia. Let me first thank you for organizing this event. It will most likely be the first in a series of uh, several actions that we will be conducting together in the future. This is our will. The Port of Philadelphia, as you all know, is a global leader as a hub for the transportation of produce to the east coast, coast of the US. It's a main port of entry for Argentina's produce for the east coast. And we've increased the exported cargo in all categories in 2020. In citrus fruit, we've increased uh, in pears, in apples, among other produce. So this jointly organized seminar is the outcome of that relevance that I've just mentioned and of this partnership that's been growing in our country between our country and the Port of Philadelphia. In this seminar with us are the authorities of the port. They will describe the logistical advantages they offer for import. With us are also importers who will describe the characteristics of the market, demand, the trading of these products and of course with us are our Argentine exporters who through the major industry chambers will present our tradable products for this market. It's worth remembering that Argentina exported in 2020 1.75 billion US dollars worth of agri-industrial products to the United States. Of that universe, the fruit and vegetable sector accounted for 27% of the total with exports amounting to 470 million US dollars. However, in spite of the fact that this is a large number, Argentina meets only part of the demand from the US in this sector. And we target at that. According to the USDA, Argentina was ranked 10th among the major, the 10 major countries of origin of fresh and frozen fruit and vegetables in 2020. If we consider the leadership role that Argentina certainly has as an international supplier of agricultural products, let us remember that we are the major exporter and fourth producer of lemons around the world, the major world exporter of pears, the third and major producer of honey, of the major exporter of peanut butter. So the first question that comes to mind is how can we position ourselves better in this market? Of course, there's much work to be done for us to increase our exports to this market and seminars like this, which we are organizing today, move in that direction. The work that we need to engage in, trying to bring together in a single event, the different players in the supply chain that make up the fruit export business. This will necessarily promote a better understanding and will strengthen our exports. For Argentina, 
it is essential to make the characteristics of our products known. Of course, we have a unique exportable set of products because of the low level of usage of agrochemicals and because of the increasing organic production in our country. All of that defines a high quality offer, a unique offer. For this reason, I'd like to thank all of our partners here with us and let me turn the floor to our Under Secretary for the Promotion of Trade and Investments in Argentina, with whom we've worked very hard and we have a work plan for the rest of the year, which is certainly very attractive. So Ambassador Pablo Sivori, you have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you, Mr. Arguello, Ambassador Arguello, for having given me the floor. And a real word of thanks for the great job done by the Foreign Office of our country, putting this seminar together, and definitely the authorities of the Philadelphia port that are hosting this seminar with us. The Foreign Office and this Under Secretariat for Trade and Investments Promotion, we made it our goal right from the start to start developing and implementing a strategy to promote exports, focusing on the increase and diversity of the volume of Argentine exports. That job that we focused on from the start is supported by joint efforts with the private sector. We are we see eye to eye with them with the idea of launching business and defining a strategic objective regarding markets that we want to reach with the quality of our products. The activity hosting us here, the, the, the focus of this seminar is part of the strategy precisely. The fact of making joint efforts between the private and the public sector to be able to achieve the, our goal, which is precisely launching greater amount of products and excellent quality products worldwide. In this case, we're talking about uh, fruit and vegetable in the US market. Argentina is well known because of its soil and uh, climate diversity. And all this allows for a great production of fruit and vegetable. I'd say it's a little bit over 7 million tons of fruits where grapes and citrus fruits prevail. But we could also talk about this array of export products produced by Argentina. As Ambassador Arguello mentioned, lemon, I mean, we're one of the main exporters worldwide. We are important actors in the pear market. We also have sweet citrus fruits like blueberries that you're all very familiar with. And we're beginning and growing to produce dry fruit which if you look at the worldwide trend is a benchmark because they're considered healthy products. In this framework, we've been walking and visiting this framework, working with the producer and exporter chambers with the idea of having more exports and the understanding that our quality, that our products are quality products and that they will allow us to reach out to the most sophisticated markets worldwide. That's why we're focusing on the US market and a market such as this one. And we believe that in this framework, regarding productive capabilities of the Argentine products, as Mr. Arwesha has said, count and relying on very few agrochemicals and the trend towards sustainability, looking at the environment and uh, environmentally friendly production, the services and the our destination and the services acquired and suggested and offered by the Port of Philadelphia is central, is key for agricultural and eatable products entering the US. And no doubt for Argentina, it's the main port to export Argentine products to the US. That's why I understand this seminar that we're beginning today is the kickoff 
the main foundation for a continuity regarding this strategy that the Foreign Office has identified, working together between the public and the private sector and reaching out private public, but binationally. This under Secretariat with Argentine exporters, our embassy, the Port of Philadelphia and importers. So all together, this is an ecosystem the first for Argentina, and we're expanding it towards a binational ecosystem where we will start coordinating supply and demand. And that's why I want to congratulate all of you, all the stakeholders present, both the Argentine exporters and American importers, and naturally the Port of Philadelphia, which as a, their platform says, they are the gateway for us to reach out to importers and providing all the necessary logistics for markets to be accessed. So this is the first step of a series of steps. This is the kickoff to work in a strategic manner with joint efforts to achieve mutual benefits, exports for Argentina, quality products with continuity for American importers and consumers. So once again, thank you so much to you all for the effort in hosting the seminar and to exporters and importers. This is no doubt the kickoff of a successful joint road that we will walk together and count on us on this under secretariat for anything that you might need. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Ambassador Aguayo and Under Sec Secretary uh, Savori for, for your remarks. We appreciate our partnership with the Embassy and with the Argentine Ministry of Foreign Affairs for this. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my, my name is Sean Mahoney and I am the Director of Marketing uh, for Philiport, the Port of Philadelphia. And it is my honor uh, to be the Master of Ceremonies for this webinar. We really have a brain trust of panelists uh, this afternoon. A uh, tremendous amount of information for anybody that's involved with perishables. Um, as many of you know, and has been outlined by M Ambassador Aguayo and Undersecretary Savori, we are the leaders in perishable and refrigerated products uh, in the US. And it's, it's with that strength and that core competency that we're gonna continue to grow our ports in Philadelphia. I've been with the port for 29 years, and it truly is an exciting time to be associated with the port of Philadelphia. We are on the cusp of great growth, and that growth is, is going to include uh, perishables from Argentina. So it's, it's really exciting for me to be the moderator uh, of the panel today. And uh, with that, I, I think I'm, my job is to keep us on time. So I'm gonna move the, the program right, right along. And I'm also, my job is to set the stage. Uh, Argentina is a very important uh, to the Port of Philadelphia. For 2020, all of our produce characteristics have increased over the previous year, and we are sure that we can do much more with your country in the future. Uh, today, we have an impressive supply chain panel for you. These are real experts in their field within the food, food su supply chain. Uh, with that, as I said, I'm going to set the stage. So I'm going to give a brief overview of the Port of Philadelphia. I'm going to share my screen and my presentation um, in Spanish. Uh, let me just back up a little bit. Uh, so here we have, so the first thing, this is a, a beautiful day in the Port of Philadelphia. And notice all the white containers and the white containers mean refrigerated boxes. These are refrigerated containers, perishables, mostly coming from uh, South America. As I mentioned, we are on tremendous growth. We are the fastest growing container port um, in the US. Uh, we are growth during the pandemic was uh, at 7% and we handled uh, 640,799 containers. We're faster, faster growing, as you can see on the right-hand side, than a lot of our peer ports uh, from, from Boston all the way to, to Savannah. We grew faster in 2020 than all those ports and including West Coast ports. Uh, our core competency is, is refrigerated uh, and containerized products, but we also do handle other products such as autos, cocoa, um, uh, liquid bulk, uh, and, and break bulk in the Port of Philadelphia. As I mentioned, we have been on a tremendous growth and over the past uh, a decade, uh, excuse me, 
uh, we've had uh, compound annual growth of over 11%. And our strength is what we call north-south trade. So our strength is trade with, with South America and, and not as much and a little bit with the uh, European markets. And uh, that just speaks to our core competency, which is refrigerated products. Um, hold on one second. Let me catch up with you in, 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 uh, in English. So in 2020, we handled over $3.8 billion in fruit products um, and $5.2 billion in food, associated food products uh, from all over the world. Um, next slide. Um, Those cargoes, as you can see, uh, mostly perishables, uh, bananas, meats, citrus, melons, pineapples, and other products. Uh, refrigerated cargoes uh, in the Delaware River are 21 up 21% compared to uh, last year. And just when you look at refrigerated products, um, our compound annual growth has sustained over 13.39%. And when you actually look at the trade between Philadelphia and the southern cone of, of South America, uh, you'll see, um, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but right now at this point, Chile is still a leader and is followed, although it's out of order, by Argentina as number two, followed by, by Brazil um, and Uruguay. And the citrus, citrus uh, being the leading product as has been outlined uh, previously, and apples and pears, uh, followed by pineapples, avocados, and other fresh fruits and grapes. Uh, as far as Argentine import volumes increased in 2020 for every fruit category. So we're moving in the right direction. And as far as Argentine imports through the port of Philadelphia, the estimated values has also increased uh, both in the citrus across the board, but uh, mostly citrus and in the categories of uh, apples, apples and nuts. And the, the biggest thing that has happened in the Port of Philadelphia over the past uh, several years is the investment in infrastructure and capital. We have invested close to a billion dollars in infrastructure improvements, land side improvements and uh, water side improvements. So this is one of the larger vessels that is called the Packer Avenue Marine Terminal. Um, it's a 14,000 container size or TEU size vessel. Uh, this is the same size vessel that is currently calling uh, the Port of New York and other competing ports on the Eastern Seaboard. So we can handle those same, so same size uh, vessels. We handle some of the largest and, and the biggest uh, ocean carriers in the world uh, from CMA to Maersk to Hamburg Sud to Hapag Lloyd to, to Mediterranean shipping. Um, temperature control products are a strength of ours. One second, let me just catch up. And one of the big things for us is, is what they call peak season stress. And in the Port of Philadelphia, uh, we, we pride ourselves on, on three principles, and that's velocity, proximity to the market, and flexibility. Um, Velocity at the gates, we have uh, installed in our operator, Holt Logistics has installed uh, optical character recognition, OCR, so, which means that the, vet, the truck drivers don't have to stop the truck, get out of the cab, they just move continuous flow uh, from the entrance to the terminal, through the terminal and, and out. And we pride ourselves on truck term times of less than 40, 40 minutes. And, and most times it's in the 35 minute uh, range. Uh, flexibility, if needed, uh, there can be segregated uh, container piles, uh, meaning that uh, segregated piles where the shippers can actually go to a stack configuration, which is a, a, a speed thing. Extra long gate hours when it's required. We have best in class service for terminal staff and accessibility. And we have an on dock uh, centralized examination CS uh, to inspect the fruit immediately uh, directly uh, on dock. Uh, you'll see here that that on dock inspection building 
in the in the photo to the upper right hand side. It's a state of the art uh, CVB cold storage inspection station, designed with food safety in mind and designed with CVB in mind with the goal to double the inspection productivity of each inspector. Uh, the investment uh, was was over three point five uh, million dollars. Uh, all part ports talk about temperature controlled capacity and in port of Philadelphia. Uh, we are one of the leaders as far as on dock, uh, near dock, uh, refrigerated on, uh, capacity, as well as refrigerated plugs uh, for, for refrigerated containers. We have over 2,500 uh, uh, refrigerated plugs uh, on the Packer Avenue Marine Terminal. And we have government agencies uh, on site, uh, extensive relationship with all the federal government uh, agencies and their experts in the Port of Philadelphia on perishable, since we are such a, a leader. Uh, on DOC, uh, they are on DOC, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, U.S. Customs, uh, CBP, and uh, U.S. Uh, USDA. Um, I'll just skip over it. And so this speaks to the, the core principles uh, of what we're going to hear from today, which is refrigerated uh, uh, companies uh, with, with expertise in refrigerators, both from transportation, logistics, cold store, uh, fruit importers and brokers, and, and freight forwarders. And it's always nice uh, to hear uh, testimonials. And um, uh, one testimonial from one of the leading cold storages in the region uh, stated recently, when our customers choose Philadelphia, they're always happy with the move. They, they, their chilled and frozen food uh, see best in class service and cycle times shipping via Philadelphia are very short. Um, just moving right along, we also have a series of USDA eye houses uh, for beef in the Port of Philadelphia, over um, 11 uh, eye houses or 13, excuse me, eye houses in the, in the area. Speaks to our strength in refrigerated products. And uh, this is actually a very interesting, um, it shows um, how in the advent of, of logistics, large box retailing, how no longer are the, are, is distribution near uh, our competitors in the Port of New York. They're actually moving down closer to the Port of Philadelphia in South Jersey and across what we call the Lehigh Valley Corridor. Um, so, you know, as we say, the cargo is actually moving closer and closer to Philadelphia every day. Um, and we also have overweight uh, container. So we have the legislation uh, to able to be able to move overweight containers in the Port of Philadelphia. Um, and we also have three class one railroads, uh, both Norfolk Southern, CSX, these are regional railroads. And interesting thing about this, we also have CN, which is called uh, Philadelphia in the, in recently starting two years ago. And that's dedicated cold, uh, certified cold storage uh, by rail to the markets of uh, Montreal and uh, Toronto. So second day service, uh, which is was quite unique uh, in the logistics world. We also, as the Philadelphia uh, uh, Port Authority, are owners uh, of, of the largest contiguously refrigerated produce market in the world, they tell me. It's over approximately 700,000 uh, square feet. And uh, it's really a fantastic uh, building. We welcome everybody, all the participants today to, to not only come to the port, but also to visit the uh, wholesale produce market. And recently we broke ground on an exciting new project, the $50, $50 million uh, distribution center, um, which is a near dock facility. And its first phase will be a dry space. And we, we hope to announce uh, shortly the second phase of this expansion will be a refrigerated uh, warehouse of, of similar size of around 200,000 uh, square feet. This is a, a Google Earth image, and, and I only share this with the audience. It shows on the left-hand side a huge development of over 3,000 acres of formerly um, old uh, industrial site that's going to be one of the U.S.'s leading uh, logistics hubs. It's, it's currently going in transition, and we actually had a meeting yesterday with the developers where they're going to make this a world-class logistics park. And so it, it just shows that we are thinking about the future and we'll be adding more near dock refrigeration in, in quickly in the next few years. Thank you very much. And I'm happy now uh, to, to move along with the program. And um, you can just bear with me. 
for one second. So uh, next, we're going to uh, move to the to our panel, um, and I'm happy um, we're going to be starting uh, next with U.S. Customs' role in produce imports. Uh, Chief Inspector Elliot Ortiz. Elliot Ortiz is the Chief Agricultural Specialist for the U.S. Customs in Philadelphia. U.S. Customs protects the U.S. and facilitates trades. Chief Ortiz is responsible for customs agricultural work in the greater Philadelphia area, which includes uh, produce cargoes in value of $3.8 million. It is my pleasure to introduce to you today, uh, Elliot Ortiz. Thanks, Sean. I don't know if you have the presentation there, Sean, or um, Dominic has it. I believe uh, Luce has the presentation. Um, if I, I, I don't have it, um, so. Uh, yes, I can, I can pass it one minute, please. If you just uh, bear with us, I think that we're just trying to bring up uh, yeah. the presentation. Uh, would it, Luis, Luis, would yes. be, should we jump ahead and possibly to the next speaker and then come back to uh, Mr. Ortiz? Yes, I think that would be best because um, I it's downloading from the from the folder. Okay, Elliot, we'll, we'll uh, Chief Inspector, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to, um, we'll proceed with the program and uh, we'll jump ahead to the Premier Gateway for Argentine Produce and uh, Mr. Leo Holt. Uh, Leo Holt is president of Holt Logistics, which op operates the Packer Avenue Marine Terminal, the largest marine terminal in the Philadelphia region. The, the Packer Terminal handles most of the Argentine cargo that arrives in our area. Leo and his family have been handling perishable cargoes in Philadelphia for over four, for four generations. And with that, Leo, uh, please to turn it over to Leo Holt. Ready? Yeah. Yes. Buenas tardes, Embajador. Good afternoon, Ambassador. Good afternoon, and the Secretary. And you're very welcome. Here we are. This is our office on the Delaware River. And as you can see, you can see the terminal at the back. That is the Packer Avenue Marine Terminal. We're on top of the other terminal, the Gloucester Marine Terminal. And Sean has uh, provided so much info about Packer Avenue that I really don't have that much to say. And not so many details will be necessary, but um, I'm going to launch my presentation. It will take me a minute. So right, the first I would like to do is to thank the people, the uh, Argentine Embassy team, because this is a wonderful opportunity that we're so happy to be making use of. We'll, in a few years, it will be our centennial at logistics activity. And all along, all this time, there are days that I feel that I've been here the whole century through. I work here and I have been working here ever since I was a young man, and today I'm 50. 
So a great part of that time has been used to grow and develop the logistics chain between Argentina and the US. My first trip to Buenos Aires, that was in 1985 back then. And all along, I have traveled from Goja to Entre Rios. These are locations in the interior of Argentina. And this has been beautiful because my compensation was not just work, but all these natural and uh, heritage parks where there is hunting in Argentina. And I've been, I've made so many friends in Argentina. It's been a win-win uh, trip all along. So we have meat packing plants, we do logistics and we touch upon all the US and Canada and Argentina all this time, all along, ever since the steel exports from Argentina and concentrated apple juice, apples, pears, so many other products like beef, which we all are so familiar with, not just us, the whole world is. So we're so happy to welcome more and more products from Argentina every day. As you can see, this is a logistics system. Look at number eight on the right. Can you see it in the bottom part of the photo? That's our building. Can you see it? And there's a million, a hundred thousand square feet of an array of solar panels on our roof. And that's our private effort. If you look at the river, that's the Packer Avenue Marine Terminal, as Mr. Mahoney has suggested. And then we have the railway system. We also mentioned that. Can you see it? And look at number seven. That's another pier ready to unload and load bulk containers, which is our specialty in this port has been a specialty for a long time. And there's a regrowth, a rebirth of that uh, specialty. We partner with the agency represented by Sean. And this partnership is a long-term partnership. We've been partners with them for 55 years. And that's why the building that seems like uh, is the port of inspections, it's an inspection house, is an investment that is a six million investment, one year long investment that dates back to one year. And if you look at the cranes, the cranes are at the dock. That's another public and private investment, a PP investment, and that investment model, I believe, is a beautiful incentive for both parties um, paving the way for growth. At Packer Avenue, and as you see these in uh, capital letters, this is the region, which is a big camp for eatables, for frozen products and refrigerated products from all over the world. But as Sean said, principally from north to south. And that's why the port didn't suffer that much when we lacked all these products that uh, ports like Los Angeles, New York, and others suffered during the COVID days. But we're doing, we're doing, we're stable and we keep growing. Those cranes that you see there in the photo, can you see them? They're there since 2004. And right now, they're the only ones that are not super Panamax, but they work beautifully well to unload fruit every week and take the fruit to the refrigerating storage that you see in the photo. These are typical storage photos. And here the private terminal called Gloucester Marine Terminal and We've unloaded 
conventional steam vessels at a certain time that they came from Argentina actually right now. We're getting more products in containers at Packer Avenue and we're uh, transshipping them by truck to these terminals. In both terminals, we can um, do cold storage and from this point of view, we have our own offices, by the way. If this is all run by the people who are there for the, who we call CBP, the Border Patrol, Customs and Border Patrol, but I'm not going to talk about that because I leave that to uh, Chief Ortiz. This is another uh, typical uh, meat packing house, and this is some of the services available in this chain. They're all part of the chain, and this is important, and the mar maritime line, the customs brokers that Orion, for instance, who worked in the past and right now is working there too, they're all part of the team, and the chain is a major chain. This is another terminal that serves for extra cargo, special cargo that needs uh, special care. There's a P of five. It used to be a sawmill ages ago, but now it's a dock, naturally. And the new project southward crossing the river and quite close to the Philadelphia airport. This is a terminal which handles and serves steel right now, but it's growing. There is a huge project for uh, wind electricity, wind power. These will be 40 hectares focusing on that for the next decades. This would be the poles in the sea supporting turbines. This is the future design. This is an artistic rendering of what the terminal will look like. And as I said, the meat packing houses, we're harvesting. This is a different kind of harvesting, but we're harvesting from solar energy and 70%, a big percentage of energy consumption. We believe this model is an important project for all countries, including Argentina. Argentina has so much sun because it's an efficient use of lost space and can also help the national system for the creation and production of energy and electricity. As Sean mentioned, another long-term investment, this is phase one of a distribution hub, and this will be dry storage, no refrigerating facilities, but there's so many products coming from dairy, activities, dairy industry, or a dry storage, such as clothes, garments, so many things. And the next phase, will we will make an announcement. We hope to do for this to be a quick announcement, as Sean said, which will give us more capacity. This will be handled by the customs people and the terminal people in an efficient way and together with the interventions of the highways to be built right by these facilities. This is a brief tour I've given you of all our activities, but in particular, I'd like to say that the possibility of you people come in person, come and visit, because we we miss you, we miss the visit. I would like to invite you all attending the seminar to come to Philadelphia, visit us. We're looking forward to having you. We'll be delighted to see you. All the Porteños, the people from Buenos Aires and all the Argentines where we will be able to enjoy 
the most important word in this conversation, a good asado. An asado is the Argentine for barbecue, but not quite the same thing with Argentine beef. So thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, we really appreciate your comments and uh, sharing with you your expertise. And now I think we will move back uh, to uh, Chief Agricultural Specialist, Elliot Ortiz. and. Uh, I know that uh, sometimes the CBB can look, uh, you know, a bit intim intimidating because they wear a gun, but uh, we're very fortunate in the Port of Philadelphia. These gentlemen that, that uh, work with CBP are very approachable and very willing uh, to share with you their knowledge and, and how to bring in products uh, through the Port of Philadelphia. So thank you, Elliot. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Sean. Um, like Sean mentioned earlier, uh, my name is Elliot Ortiz. I'm the Chief Agriculture Specialist for the Area Port of Philadelphia. Um, on behalf of Area Port Director Joseph Martella, Assistant Port Director Edward Moriarty, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, embajador, muchas gracias por esta oportunidad. Este, conozco Argentina, he visitado este Argentina, este, Ambassador, thank you for this opportunity to come into contact with Argentina, which is a country I'm very fond of. Okay, our mission. Our mission is to safeguard America, America's borders, thereby protecting the public from dangerous people and materials while enhancing the nation's global economic competitiveness by enabling legitimate travel and trade. We are the guardians of our nation's borders. We are America's front line. We safeguard the American homeland at and beyond our borders. We protect the American public against terrorists and instruments of terror. We steadfastly enforce the laws of the United States while fostering our nation's economic security through lawful international travel and trade. We serve the American public with vigilance, integrity, and professionalism. Next slide. Okay. United States agriculture, according to the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, agriculture is the largest industry and employment sector in the United States with more than 1 trillion in annual economic activity. The greatest risk to success of this industry are exotic pests and foreign animal diseases. Invasive species have cost approximately 138 billion annually in economic and environmental losses in the United States. Each day's U.S. Customs and Border Protection (CBP) helps to prevent the intentional and unintentional introduction of potentially harmful plant pests and foreign animal diseases into the United States at more than 300 ports. The Port of Philadelphia agricultural stats. The Port of Philadelphia has um, the Philadelphia International Airport processes a large number of passengers arriving from international destination. The Port of Philadelphia Seaport processes a large number of cargo. Um, through that cargo, we do find quarantine materials interceptions, animal byproducts, meat products, plant material, and soil. And um, once in a while, we get pest interceptions, which are submitted for identification. And a significant amount are identified reportable, which means that the materials or the produce needs to be treated. Next slide. Okay, the area port of Philadelphia, what does it um, uh, is composed of? The area port of Philadelphia is composed of the state of Pennsylvania with the ports of Pittsburgh, Harrisburg, and Philadelphia. Harrisburg also has the, sport, the ports of Scranton and Allentown. The southern part of New Jersey from Trenton all the way down to Cape May the whole state of Delaware with Dover military base and Wilmington, Delaware. And it approximately has, it has miles of rivers, three states, numerous piers and terminals, um, airports, military bases, a United Parcel Service Hub, UPS, foreign trade zones, rail hubs, a central examination station, CES, and marinas. Next slide. Port of Philadelphia agricultural canine teams. The next slide. Okay, the K-19s, we don't usually see these in the, in the seaport in the cargo environment at the Port of Philadelphia, but we do have canines dedicated for agriculture. We have here on the left on the left slide, um, K-9 Porter and on the right side, K-9 uh, Nikki. However, they are ports that have 
large breeds of dogs um, dedicated to the cargo environment for Seaport itself. Next slide. What is needed by CBP? What documents are needed for you guys to bring to make an entry or um, to bring things into the United States? A manifest, a foreign site certificate of inspection and or treatment, PPQ 203, that is if it's pre-cleared in um, foreign, a, a foreign phytosanitary certificate and other permits that you could be a, a PPQ form or Convention of International Trade and Endangered Species of Florida Fauna CITES um, or an Endangered Species Act ESA permit. And the CBP deployed the Automated Commercial Environment System, ACE, and decommissioned the Automated Commercial System, ACS, by the end of 2016. On October 1st, 2016, the mandatory use of ACE for all remaining electronic portions of the CBP cargo process was implemented. All electronic trade processing was made mandatory in, in ACE. So what that means that instead of bringing original documentation, the invoices, um, all that was basically um, erased and made easier uh, submitted through ACE. ACE is a, it's a system which us CBP and the trade community both have access and we're able to see any document that is uploaded there. The document images system allows trade partner to submit documents, images, and associated description data to CBP, which makes it easier and faster to clear shipments. Um, and a note, the import requirements are subject to, to change. And if, the, and if they do change, um, we do get prior, uh, prior notice. And for more information regarding our culture, you've got the um, website down there. Usually it's www.aphis.usda.gov. Next slide. So the, the airport of, of Philadelphia processes a large number of perishables. Just a picture of uh, just a couple of them, of the items that we um, process here. Next slide. Now, this is a, a, a pie chart that um, one of the supervisors did for us here. Basically, let, let us know as of uh, the fiscal year uh, 2020, um, some agricultural commodities that were imported from Argentina through the port of Philadelphia itself. And we can see that lemons has been basically a huge impact there, 43.31%, while frozen beef um, has uh, 23, uh, almost you know, 23%. Per percent. So we can see that the biggest ones are basically um, lemons and frozen beef, but we also see in the pie chart there that pears also has a significant amount of um, importation here. So I would say lemons and pears and then um, frozen beef will be the primary three agricultural products coming to the port to the, to the port of Philadelphia from Argentina. Next slide. Okay, these are some stats of the TNE shipments from Argentina through the port of Philadelphia. So basically, TNEs are transit and exit permits. So these things are coming here, but they're in transit to Canada. So what it means is it still has to do um, clearance in the first port of arrival into the U.S. because it's coming foreign. However, if everything um, is okay, all the documents match and all, everything uh, passed, the shipment basically comes in. We um, do a clearance on it, make sure the documents are good, and we verify the seals and you know, put a new seal and it goes on its way to Canada. So um, these shipments don't stay, generally stay in the U.S., um, but they still have to be cleared by us. So um, the, one of the main differences in, in why Philadelphia and Fort Lauderdale, Miami what was this was a difference, and this is one of the one of those. We are um, at a higher um, latitude than um, the South Gulf ports, which were Miami and um, Fort Lauderdale would, would, would go through. And for them to have the the ability to do T and E, which is uh, trans transport and export to Canada, would be very difficult. Well. We were approximately, um, you know, we could put anywhere for time frame from seven to 10 hours from the uh, Canadian border, depending on which border you, you're going to use. That gives us a pretty um, good advantage as, you know, the Port of Philadelphia is equipped with uh, fumigation capabilities and also um, core storage. Next slide. Okay. Um, this is just for you guys to have an idea of the number of volume of frozen beef that comes through the Port of Philadelphia from our Argentina. In fiscal year 2020, approximately 608 shipments of frozen beef products were imported from our Argentina through the port of, of Philadelphia. So for the frozen beef, we basically um, 
verify that it came through. There's some paperwork we fill out and send it to our counterparts in USDA. And it's a, it should be a pretty easy streamlined process. We do not try to um, hold any perishable items or any meat items that need to be released. There, um, we try to be as compliant as possible, but we also understand that these items need to be out there and the you know in it, where, whether it's the warehouses, whether it's the supermarkets, whether it's going to be um, in a distribution center. Um, through the pandemic, we work um, pretty good with our counterparts in the Port of Philadelphia and, and the Holtz. And um, we basically got everything done. And despite, you know, um, the pandemic, the Port of Philadelphia came through and, um, it, you know, these pro produce were, were put in, you know, into, um, you know, sh shops and supermarkets and people were able to feed their families. So, um, you know, um, a hard, hard time through the pandemic, but um, we, we got it done. Next slide. Here's an example of um, the form that is used uh, for shipments. Um, and in the Port of Philadelphia, the closest ones that we have for facilities for um, rapid defrost are um, in Camden Port Services, Milica Hill Port Storage, and um, there's in Milica Hill, and then there's another one in Pedrick Town. So we have at least three facilities that are in the close proximity um, regarded for, you know, for, um, for meat the products itself. Next slide. Okay, significant quarantine and exceptions. These are the pests that, that, that are found on the items. These are the things we try to avoid to make sure they don't come in. Um, even if we have these um, insects here, we don't want more of them. And if we don't have them here, we don't want them here. And this is just a, an example of a couple of them there that we deal with are the three thrips, the cricket, o el grillo, um, the moths, o la polilla, um, termites, la termitas, the true bug, the weevils, the beetles, the nephor moths, and the tiger moths. Next slide. Okay, here's an example of a, of a weevil beetle that uh, we find in, 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 in blueberries. And this is just an example for you guys to see. Um, you know, in the naked eye, it could be it can look small, but once we do the zoom in and we actually um, see the the how these things are composed, one one of those itself here, um, it can't be that damaging. But just imagine, you know, when they come, they come, you know, in, in, in packs. You know, just one, just always are going to follow. So these are the things we're trying to avoid. At the naked eye, it may not seem like like much, but once these things get introduced, they're 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 costly to eradicate. Next slide. Here are some of the numbers approximately of the Port of Philadelphia peasant interceptions. This is not, um, you know, a, a this is for you guys to have an approximate num number out of pests. So all the insects, uh, 127, followed by contaminated seeds, then prohibited products and prohibited um, animal products. So we all can see here that by far the insects are the largest um, concern that we have. There are biggest count for interception so, so far. While the other things are important, you guys can see the difference between the 127 pest interceptions compared to the 20 that we have with the seeds. And the lacking the um, ISPM 15 marking, which is international standards for sanitary measures, that basically means that any wood that comes in that is greater than six millimeters, we have to make sure it's treated. So that's what the um, ISPM mark marking means. Next slide. Federal noxious weeds. So the weeds, um, basically, a lot of people don't don't see them as as a contaminant pest or something um, that would be um, bad for agriculture in itself, but they are because some of these weeds they take over the natural environment, they take over the plants, they take over the harvest, and it becomes a real issue. And here we have an example of some weeds on the left slide that are coming in a crate. And then on the right side, it came in on a um, tire. So they don't seem as much, and sometimes they're hard to catch on the naked eye. But um, these things are very, um, you know, uh, dangerous for um, U.S. agriculture. So that's why we, we're here in place. We try to do our best to identify it and make sure those things don't enter. Next slide. Okay, here's a pie chart of the um, federal not, not, um, noxious weeds that we found. And the, the, yeah, the blue one, the 33% is the wild sugar cane. That is one of our um, biggest ones that, that we have. And um, 
and then we have the um you know we followed there by uh the the other ones there but the biggest impact for us right now is the wild sugar king the one to the left right there so um out of out of the four that we commonly see we can see that there's a clear you know clear difference between the wild sugar cane and the rest next slide okay and now we have a percentage for you guys to see um the federal one and actually we in fiscal year 2020 so um the wild sugar cane you guys see has more than half of the um of the chart which is 62 percent and then followed by uh, model of a minute, which is basically 20%. And then the Congress, which is 14, and then the code buttons, which is 4%. But this is just a little chart for you guys to have an idea that how impactful these um, weeds could see are. And, and we may not think of them as much. And sometimes we think of seeds like the actual seeds that go for planting, but for a federal noxious, you know, it could be just a strip or something that would eventually eat as a seed, will grow, disseminate, and then grow. Next slide. Okay, contaminant wood packing material. Okay, for wood packing material that comes in, which is uh, wood that's gonna come in for um, packing um, produce coming in, um, it needs to have a valid IPPC logo. So a valid international plant protection convention logo. No presence of um, pests, no indication, no indication of pests. So, it needs to have the, the logo like that. It needs to have the IPPC logo. It needs to have the country code, the location code, and what um, treatment it has, which is methyl bromide MB or heat treatment HHT. Um, next slide. So here's an example of non-compliant, which means they're not this, is, you know, basically it's not appropriate. The left one, we see that it's basically a um, paper with um, a printed um, label in there. And you know that's that's unacceptable. On the right side, we see that it's not even compliant. It doesn't have the IPPC logo. I can't tell what type of treatment it is. It has CH slash zero zero one, but basically it's it's not compliant. It needs to be on the wood um, and with the with the markings that are required. Next slide. Okay, actual wood boring pests. These pests are the ones that are actually in the wood that actually get into the wood. And um, and as as I said before with the Fibonacci's uh, seeds and the other pests, we try to avoid these at, at all costs. And this is why we inspect wood coming in um, into the U United States. You guys to see, can see that the Siberian bisidae, which is 69%, that's the longhorn beetle. That's the um, largest concern we have right now with wood coming in. And, um, and at times, there is times where the wood is treated properly and it has the, the, the seal on it, and we still find insects in there. And basically what we're looking for is to make sure that there's no holes in there um, big enough that, that we think an insect is in there or if there's any damage or any bark in the wood, we obviously are gonna check just to make sure there's no insects in there. But overall, um, our biggest concern with the wood is the longhorn beetle. Next slide. And here's an example of non-compliant beetle. Infested, uh, infested or shows evidence of pests um, you guys can see right there where the yellow mark is at, there's a insect in there, um, a larve, and then to the bit to the right, you guys can see there's a hole in there. So these are the type of things we look for when we look at wood. Next slide. And thank you very much for the opportunity and any questions, I'll be um, happy to answer them. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chief. Uh, Agricultural Specialist Ortiz, and, and I just want to remind everybody that we're going to have uh, questions and answers at the end of the program, so I make sure all, all the, you know, you stay tuned for that at, you know, immediately following the, 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 the last panelist. So now we're going to be moving to refrigerated warehousing and produce repacking operations in, in uh, Philadelphia region, uh, Chris Ryan. Chris Ryan is Director of Key Accounts fresh produce for Americold Logistics, the largest operator of refrigerated warehousing in, in the US and is one of the largest in the world. In previous roles, Chris worked as a marine terminal operator, uh, ocean barge with Ocean Barge Company, as well as freight forwarder. And he has always been involved in perishable. So with that, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Chris Ryan. Thank you very much, Sean. I appreciate it. And thank you again for hosting this uh, wonderful event. So uh, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so this is a bird's eye view of our Vineland, New Jersey facility. Um, 
So I'll go on to the next slide. So here you'll see our proximity to the Port of Philadelphia and the Packer Avenue Marine Terminal. Our physical address is 2321 Industrial Way in Vineland, New Jersey. We are 35 miles uh, from the Port of Philadelphia and 40 minutes drive. Um, so that makes us very well positioned for um, distribution into the Northeast and also to uh, the rest of the country. Um, so we have service to 33% of the addressable market uh, from our Vineland facility. And we're also less than one mile away from uh, the New Jersey uh, 55 exit. Uh, so here you'll see some statistics regarding our Vineland, New Jersey facility. Um, we have 217,000 square feet of multi-temperature storage space ranging from 28 degrees to 55 degrees. Um, we also have a fully refrigerated loading dock, which is 110,000 square feet. Uh, we also have a very large repack area of 108,000 square feet with 24 repacking lines. Um, so in, in totality, we have 19,500 racked pallet positions. Um, inside the facility, we have 26 separate rooms ranging from 250 to 2,600 pallet positions. So each of the rooms are um, able to, to go into multi-temperature uh, 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 spaces. And so we're able to uh, manipulate those temperatures for the specific commodities that are uh, being stored in those rooms. Uh, we also have a mechanical room uh, that stores all of our MHE equipment. And um, so that's 3000 square feet. Uh, we have 64 loading dock doors. Uh, so it gives us ample space for inbound and outbound activity at the space. We are also uh, certified by HACCP and Primus uh, for food safety. And we also have secured areas um, inside the facility to keep all the containers and our facility um, safe. So um, some of the value added services that we provide at the Vineland facility are cold treatment for a uh, product that is arriving uh, via vessel and has failed cold treatment uh, upon arrival. Um, and also for air freight that's coming in uh, that needs to be treated upon arrival to satisfy US import requirements. We also have a room, uh, which you'll see up here on the top, uh, that does fumigation with methyl bromide. Uh, so it's all TARP-based uh, you know, um, methyl bromide fumigation services. And we can fit 280 pallets um, in that room. In that room, we also provide pre-cooling um, services so that we get the product down to the correct temperature uh, before putting it back into a rack pallet position. Uh, we also do other import entry required services upon request too. And we also do export services uh, for anything that is needing to be re-exported out um, of the country, especially to the Canadian market. So uh, we have USDA AMS, which is right on, uh, right in our facility with uh, services uh, you know, for re-exportation. Um, in the middle, you'll see our repack operation, where at the top there's a mezzanine with um, you know, dry packaged goods, which are then filtered down into the repack area for uh, repacking into consumer bags. Um, so I'll get that in, into uh, some of the, the previous slides of the different types of repack options that we have available. Um, we also do have inspection services right at the facility that are performed by QC inspection companies. And we also have our own internal inspection services um, you know, to look at the quality of the product and uh, report back to the importers and exporters, um, you know, of, of how their product looks at the time that it arrives to our facility. So here is our repack and retail packaging types that uh, we have an example on. So these are just the examples that we have and, and the most um, you know, utilized at retail in the United States, but uh, we are open to all different types of retail packaging um, you know, options that retailers might be requesting. So don't hesitate to reach out if there's something uh, you know, that's not here, uh, we can certainly um, you know, help out with that. And this is a really exciting piece of equipment that we had installed back in 2019. It's an optical grader uh, for produce. So um, this allows us to repack the, the product 
um, in the most efficient way and give the most maximum accuracy and yield to um, maximize the return back to the grower. Um, so this technology will use an array of cameras to take pictures of the fruit, um, up to 300 images actually. Um, so it really gives us a, a great piece of uh, equipment to you know, provide that um, you know, maximum yield back to the grower. Um, and it really uh, does an amazing job. So um, the way that it works is um, the, the product will be automatically loaded onto the lines um, and then it'll be you know, going through the grader um, and then it, it'll be the fruit will shoot out based upon what the, uh, the grading is. Um, and then it'll be put into um, you know, individual bags and then be uh, you know, ready for um, distribution out to the retailer. Um, so, you know, the, the basis of this uh, slide is to show that we're um, heavily invested in making sure that the growers are getting the, the best possible packouts. Um, here's some more pictures of the packing line and also an example of what um, our operators will see as far as the um, optical grading and, and being able to see where the defects are in the fruit. Um, so we are able to uh, utilize this machine up to 20 hours per day, which allows us to uh, you know, efficiently repack in the summer uh, seasons when volume is at its greatest. Um, so that's that. Uh, then I wanted just to get into our transportation uh, division. So we're able to provide an integrated solution to our customers uh, from the time that it hits the Port of Philadelphia till the time it gets to the retailer. Um, so we operate the largest drayage fleet within the Port of Philadelphia. We have our overweight chassis that we um, own as assets, and we also have the permits to um, dray overweight containers from the port to our facility. Um, so that allows for 100% compliance with DOT regulations um, and ensures that you're in compliance with the law. Um, and then we also uh, have an LTL um, and FTL delivery map, which you can see uh, the, the distribution and the time that it takes to get from our market to the other parts of the country. Um, so we use a uh, non-asset based carrier type model uh, to do brokerage throughout the country. And uh, we run these trucks at 36 and 38 degrees. Um, so that allows for you know, a, a multi uh, distribution model with different types of commodities that can be uh, put onto the trucks and better utilize uh, for uh, transportation spend. <clears throat> and so that's really it. So here's my contact information. So uh, we, we look forward to uh, bringing in even more Argentinian fruit. Um, we're, we're currently having uh, the pears and, and um, apples into our facility right now. So we're excited also to bring those lemons and, and blueberries uh, in the next season. So. Thank you again to the Philadelphia Port Authority and also to the Embassy of Argentina for including me on this panel. And uh, we look forward to helping out with uh, you know the rest of the season and, and uh, for many years from now. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Chris. Uh, thank you for your, re your remarks. And now we'll move to the role of the freight forwarder in exporting produce uh, to the US. Uh, Christine Stanton is an import specialist for Global Customs House broker and freight forwarder Savini Del Bene. She has worked for manufacturers and freight forwarders, and she has an extensive history in bringing valuable cargoes into the U.S. Savina Del Bene has a robust business between Argentina and Philadelphia, including most recently, most recently, a office in Mendoza, which we recently cooperated with. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Christine Stanton. Thank you, Sean. Um, hello, everyone. I would like to thank everyone uh, for the invitation today to participate in the panel for the webinar. Um, as Sean said, my name is Christine. I work for Savino Del Bene. Um, been in the industry of import for a little while now, maybe a little longer than I'd like to say. Um, so I just want to go over briefly as to what the role is for the freight forwarder. Um, and what parts and how we can um, expedite the uh, freight through the whole process from the port of lading um, 
all the way through to our final destination, should that be um, the Enconsigny or another facility, I'll use Americold, you know, for example, um, to where the it's further. I am going to share my screen. Begin. Bear with me one moment. Uh, let's see. So, um, again, just my little introduction. Currently, uh, we do have four offices in Argentina. Mm -hmm. In Buenos Aires, um, also at the airport. We do have a large export um, traffic coming from Mendoza as well as Tucumán. So we are currently already assisting with that um, produce. Just a brief um, overview as to how these operations work. Uh, everything from the port of origin and from our overseas counterparts is fed through EDI, it's uh, electronic data interfacing or interchange. Um, so all of it is very, um, the workflow is very smooth. It automatically flows from our foreign offices um, to where we provide all the information to the end consignee. We provide the information for the customs broker, um, so on and so forth. Next is our sea freight services. We operate full container loads. Um, we have all types of equipment, temperature controlled shipments, um, cold chain maintenance, ocean reefer freight, um, a strong global cross trade uh, network that we utilize very frequently. Um, security services, should they be needed, and the port handling um, to move from the port again to the final destination. Anything that has required temperature controls or packaging and tracking is obviously available. Um, just briefly for the Ocean Import Clearance Officer Ortiz went through this quite well. So I'm just going to touch on it very briefly. Uh, everything is transmitted through ACE. It, that is the uh, platform for customs and the partnering agencies. Um, AMS, ISF, all of that is taken care of through our internal brokerage department. We also do uh, deal quite frequently with external brokerage departments as well. That gives our clients a, a flexibility when it comes to moving things and facilitating things through customs. So that helps with that. And of course, very basic things that should be provided to the customs broker. Um, a, a power of attorney is always required for anyone to bring imports and that's how the, bus, the customs broker is giving um, control of that. There are some documents that, basic documents that do need to be put into place prior to a shipment leaving the port of lading. Um, those are, of course, the CF-5106, power of attorney, um, and some bond information will be needed to move it inland for the dryage. Um, of course, anyone that has more than 10 shipments are uh, encouraged strenuously to apply for a yearly bond. It just makes more sense for them to do it that way. Um, due to the fact that if you don't have a continuous bond on file, it will be needed for each shipment, which can be costly in the end if you have a high volume. Uh, so for the freight forwarders, we expedite it, move it as quickly as possible from point A to point B uh, with as minimal uh, problems or issues. We partner with, of course, everyone in the Philipport and uh, further areas. We will be able, we are able to perform the dryage to wherever your ultimate consignee is or your facility that it's destined to end in. Um, again, this was very brief. 
there, of course, is much more detail to go into. We're always happy here at Savino Del Bene to answer or assist in any way. Um, of course, my contact, our con contact information can be provided if anybody would like that at the end of today's uh, webinar. And thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. And everyone here at Savino Del Bene, thanks you for the opportunity. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Christine, and, and thank you for sharing your, your contact. And I just would remind uh, the audience that uh, all the presentations will be shared uh, with the viewers uh, following um, our session today. So if you've missed any information, we'll be sharing that uh, with everybody. Next, we'll be moving on to exporting Argentina produce uh, to the U.S., a buyer's viewpoint. Marcelo Dagna is with William H. Copy, Kopke Jr., one of the leading produce buyers and importers in the U.S. Marcelo handles uh, purchases of Argentine produce for his company, and he is a native Argentinian. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Marcelo Dagna. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Sean, for your words. Uh, as Sean said, I'm Marcelo Daña, and I'm country manager for Argentina and the region. I have been with Copke for a long time now. My idea is to make a brief presentation telling you who we are, to tell you the kind of fruits we import from Argentina and elsewhere. Our company, William Kopke, is a family-owned company. This is the fourth generation. It was, uh, it began in 1937. That's 84 years. It was founded by William H. Kopke Jr. And our central head office is in Long Island, New York, with offices in the West Coast, in Long Beach, and also in the East Coast. Outside the US, we have offices in Montreal, Canada, and in Hong Kong. In, the, in Asia. And that's where we also focus to send Argentine fruit to that fantastic market, a great potential there. Kopke is a leader um, marketer of uh, produce worldwide. And uh, the idea was to focus on the best uh, products from Argentina and worldwide. So we focused on the Argentine market before so many colleagues thought Argentina was uh, an option that would make the American consumers happy. Let me share with you now my screen. I would like you to see this. Here we go. Grapes. For so many years, Kopke was the biggest grape importer worldwide. We imported over 8 million boxes yearly. This was from Chile, Peru, Mexico. These are the regions that we're importing from. And now mandarins and oranges. Kopke is an important stakeholder regarding sweet citrus fruit imports. And here I'd like to make a note because Argentines, we face a big challenge as a country producing sweet citrus fruits. We need to work together, all of us, to manage to open up and access other markets. How is it possible that our neighbors in Uruguay can access the US and we cannot? And the only difference between us is the Uruguay River. Lately, the sale of sweet citrus fruits was excellent. And last year with COVID, the advice of eating a lot of sweet citrus fruits existed and a lot was sold. Now, pears and apples. Pears, we import all varieties, all cultivars, both organic and conventional, both, all of them available. The main recipient of uh, pears for over 60 years. Let me tell you and remind you that in 1942, we received the first pears from Argentina from a company called Gato Negro. Gato Negro fruits. Unfortunately, they're not in the market anymore. Such a shame. But I'd also like to tell you that in 1963, in January, Peter Kopke Sr. 
traveled, he was invited by Argentina for the first inauguration of first plant in Cipolletti. From then on, we were always present in the Argentine market. Peter keeps going to Argentina permanently to supply the American market. With pears, the challenge is to keep on offering the very best. That's the difference we've made with the rest of the world. Apples, there to be able to uh, be positioned in a good market, we acquired Stanley Orchard, the majority of the, of the stock equity there. And that's how we acquired a market share in the market. And we were able to sell imported and national mar uh, apples. Lemons. Uh, dear lemons from Tucumán and also from Salta, some of them. Lemons are the last Argentine citric fruits approved to enter the US. Copke, regarding this opening of the market, was an important stakeholder. It worked a lot to get lemons approved and made lots of presentations and filings to this effect, knowing that the quality of Argentine lemons is wonderful. And besides, Argentine lemons meet all used a compliance, USDA compliance requirements to access the American market. Cherries. As a company, we believe Argentine cherries, the differences from their competitors because of their flavor, their great taste. Just as with pears, the uh, challenge Argentines face is to keep offering excellent quality products to keep making a difference with the rest of the world. We are very good at promoting and placing orders for Argentine cherries, which led us in the last years to have a over 50% market share of all the cherries entering the US. Pomegranates. Pomegranates, that's a very recent approval of Argentine pomegranates to the US market. We worked with Chilean pomegranates too, but the Argentine pomegranates, just as cherries, have that fantastic flavor, sweet flavor, and have so many good qualities. Blueberries, which we called arandanos, were very good at distributing and selling blueberries from the main production areas in South America. Once the import season is over, we sell blueberries regionally. And this year, we started our own production in New Jersey with the proper packaging required. The American market forced our company to take important, make the important decision. One of them was the acquisition of a cold storage facility in Long Beach in the West Coast, a workhouse with 1300 storage, uh, feet storage capacity for processing the fruits that we receive in those facilities. But all this led us, made us see that we lacked the icing on the cake, as we like to say. And we made this important call because we had been working at repacking. We decided to build our own distribution hub, the KDC, Kopke Distribution Center. KDC was built in Vineland, New Jersey, and the construction of this distribution center was uh, presided over by Michael Mayers, who is currently the company's CEO, the, the, the CEO of KDC. When it came to construction, the objective was to have total control of our fruit and to become a strategic point hub to supply our customers with all the variety of our fruit, making more efficient logistics, both for us and for buyers. And this is very important to be able to manage our fruit. I'm going to show you a video and why I do. I would like you to 
pay attention because this was so important to us to build this workhouse in merely eight months. It's a quick video that shows you the construction phases. Let me say a few things. This workhouse is take, takes up 10 hectares. We have land to expand, 15,000 square meters of constructed uh, facilities, 4,000 cold storage, 4,000 meters of cold storage, with a possibility of uh, storing over 6,500 pallets, a huge space for, to repack uh, fruit under controlled temperature, and free poolings for 30,000 daily boxes and 29 entry and uh, exit gateways. So we're so happy to be able to say that in February, with pandemics so close to us, our company managed to have 70,000 pallets incorporated, 850 trucks, and uh, delivering 14,000 end pallets to supply supermarkets and clients with 12,261 cartons. So this means a big repackaging effort. KDC has the next three machines to package sizes of fruits, to repackage pears, blueberries, cherries. It's a workhouse completely up to date, modern, complete, that makes our company so proud. As a company, what we see regarding es que Argentina is the retailers American and wholesalers, the Americans, I mean, Argentina. know very well how good Argentine quality algo que no is. And que dejar this, de tener en we los need to bear in mind all the time calidad. we are Argentine, and we have Muchas to keep on exporting quality. Sometimes we calidad. hear about quantity exports by no means. We need quality exports. Painstakingly, all Argentines, I mean, together with the authorities, is to be able uh, to work at cargo loading logistics. Argentina exports from Argentine ports, such as Buenos Aires, San Antonio, Campana, to the port of Philadelphia. And it's taking us almost 30 days to get there. This forces us very often to have to overcome complications at supplying supermarkets and it forces us to resort to Chilean ports where we save time because from Chile it's only 15 days even though the channel needs to be closed. Of course, we're always talking about the East Coast, right? But this means more costs, greater costs when you look at transport. That's why we need to work painstakingly at cutting down on the time it takes us to get to the West Coast in the US. That's something that needs to be our objective. All Argentines need to work together, exporters and the authorities, to achieve a direct service to the US. We can share this with people from Uruguay, definitely with the dear friends from Uruguay, because when we're exporting pears or lemons, they begin to export their citric fruits. To conclude, thank you to the Argentine Embassy. Thank you, Ambassador Arguello. Thank you, uh, Secretary Seabody, for having given us the possibility in, of including us in the seminar, which is extremely, extremely important. And thank you very, very, very much to the Kopke family, to Peter Kopke Sr., to William and Peter Jr., for, for having believed in me to develop the Argentine market and the whole region. And this is a way to keep growing as a company and to end by being the greatest importers in the US. Thank you very much for your attention and the best regards to you all. Thank you very much, uh, Marcelo, and we really appreciate your insightful uh, comments. And now it's uh, my pleasure uh, to move on to the last uh, pet panelist of today's session. We have uh, Federico Abaya, who will be presenting on behalf of the fruit from Argentina. He will give us a, a presentation that includes blueberries, apples, pears, cherries, and uh, citrus fruit. Uh, Federico, the Zoom is yours. Thank you very much, John. Uh, first of all, I want to, I want to thank uh, 
uh, the Argentinian embassy authorities and also the foreign train department uh, and the people from the Philadelphia port to give uh, time to, the, to do this presentation. I feel very honored and very happy to, to present what is doing the, the, the most important associations of fruits in Argentina. I have a presentation, so let me share my, my screen. Here it is. Okay, what is Fruits from Argentina? Basically, it's a joint venture between the, the, the four uh, most important associations of fruits uh, here in Argentina. Uh, the ABC, which I'm a president of it, the, Ar the Argentinian Blueberry Committee. Then CAFI, which is the, the association for apples and pears. Uh, CAPSI for cherries and Feder Citrus for citrus, uh, lemons and, 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 and sweet. Okay, basically what happened was we've been traveling with, with all these uh, products, traveling to visit customers or so going to, to food logistic out to PMA. And basically what we found is we have the same problems. We have the same opportunities in the, in the markets, but we have the same problems. So we need to, we need to create something together uh, to have more representation in our country and also to create a brand uh, to represent our products uh, in the world, in the markets, in different markets. So we create this, uh, this brand, which is fruit, Fruits from Argentina. Uh, what uh, we represent here by now at this point, we need to, I mean, we are open always to, to add new chambers, as uh, we mentioned, avocados or grapes or, or pomegranates. Uh, but these four are the main, the, the most important uh, in volume and, and, and in sales. So we generate in our country 150,000 employment opportunities. That means uh, we can help the government to create uh, jobs, to create easily to, to uh, uh, diversify opportunities in different provinces. We produce fruit in, in more than 14 uh, provinces. That means 10 econo uh, regional economies. Uh, we export our, our added value to more than 70 countries, and we generate almost $2,000 uh, million, $2 billion each, each year. Um, what we feel, I mean, we feel under this umbrella, we seek uh, to achieve greater competitiveness for the sector and position our varied fruit offer in the world to arrive with a sustainable product of excellent quality and condition to different market, uh, different international markets. Um, basically is, is, is what we feel as, as growers and exporters here in Argentina. We, we are under the same umbrella and we can uh, sit to the government and show what are the markets we, we feel important to open, what are the barriers we have, what are the, uh, I mean, this kind of, of, of Congress are very important for us. Okay, this is the, the map of, uh, of, of Argentina. And where are the productions in, in the northwest, the northeast, the center, and the, and the Patagonia? Uh, basically, blueberries are in the northeast and the northwest. Um, citrus are also in the northwest with lemons, basically, and, and, and plums, and, and, and sweet citrus in, in, in the northeast. Uh, and then apple and pears in, in Patagonia, and cherries from Mendoza to the south in all the west part of the country. Um, so you can see there all the provinces are involved in each in each product uh, and, and, and it's uh, really amazing how, how many provinces have the potential to produce fruit in Argentina with uh, the best soils, the, the best uh, climate, weather and uh, water availability and, and, and also um, people. I mean, labor is, is a very important matter in, in fruits, as you all know. Uh, and we have the, I mean, a, a country that needs new, new jobs, new opportunities. So uh, I think if we do a plan as a, as a, together with the government, uh, as, as we can, we can, um, I mean, bring in new investment and the, if the conditions are there, uh, Argentina has a potential, a terrible potential to, to grow the, the supply in, in fruit uh, and also give, give a, a opportunities uh, for, for new jobs. This is the calendar. 
uh, blueberries, uh, Argentina always uh, has been the early part of the season uh, window. Uh, we started 20 years ago and our first blueberries were coming in November. Uh, with, uh, with this experience uh, in, in the last 20 years, we've been uh, moving our, our productions north, um, from, first from Buenos Aires to Concordia and then to Tucumán and Salta. Uh, looking for an early window, uh, so we can we can supply the markets when when the domestic season is off. Uh, basically, we are loading the first containers in August, so so it's perfect uh, combination with the with the end of the domestic uh, the domestic season, uh, not only in the U.S. but also in in, in Europe and other markets. Uh, well, cherries, what the cherries are doing in Patagonia is is amazing. Uh, new investments are, are coming, uh, the potential and the quality shown by the, the Argentinian cherries is, is amazing and there are a lot of opportunities uh, there to grow. Uh, lemons, what, what to say about lemons? I mean, Argentina is, is the most important exporter in the world. Um, a lot of competitiveness uh, due to the, the weather and the soils of, of, of Tucumán and, and the uh, all the industries um, investment there uh, to produce not only fresh lemons but also uh, juice and, and oil. Um, so uh, lemon investment is, is um, up to date and, and, and keep growing. Um, we had the chance to reopen the market. It was closed for, for pretty much 20 years. Um, so now it's open the last three seasons we, we were able to supply the US and this is helping us to, to grow in that market. Uh, tangerines, uh, as Marcelo said, we need to, we need to, get, the, uh, to get the authorization to, to get in the, that important market. It would be um, very important for, for the north, Northeast in Argentina. Uh, apple and pears, um, it's open, it's growing with all the organic trend, um, all the food safety, all the quality that Patagonia has in, 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 in the south. So I think um, there's plenty of opportunities and, and we are more than welcome to, to see in the next couple of years uh, avocados here and, and pomegranates and grapes. These are the, the figures that uh, we've been exporting the last eight seasons. Uh, from 2013, uh, as we can see, the last, uh, we've, we've been close to the 56,000 tons. And last year we've been in 88,000 tons. So it's a pretty nice growth uh, helped by, by the lemons, of course. Um, in uh, basically first, first season for lemons were I would say 7,000 tons, then we grew to 25,000 tons and, and last season 30, almost 35,000 tons. And I think Argentina will, will keep us showing this, this growth for the, for the lemons and also for other products. Uh, okay, a, a closer look to the, to the supply. Uh, we can see here um, all the products, pears, lemons, apples, blueberries. Okay, blueberries, it's basically we are kind of sta stabilized because we, we have a strong competition from Peru. The last five years, Peru planted a, a lot of area and have some competitive com uh, situation against, against Argentina, um, not only for the, for the weather, for the climate, uh, but also for, for proximity to the, to the market. Uh, but we are, I mean, we are still offering our, our blueberries that have a lot of flavor, a lot of uh, I mean, differentiation against, against competition uh, due to do those reasons, basically flavor and organics. And one thing it's important to mention about, uh, about the Argentinian offer of Argentinian supply, it's about the, not only the, the food safety certifications that all this supply uh, has, has, uh, has uh, like Global Gap or H, um, ACCP, or, but, but also the social ones. Uh, I mean, the, the, world is, the, the world trend is, is going that way. 
and all the retail retailers are, are demanding those kind of certifications and Argentina is one of the leaders in terms of law uh, for the for the workers so so I think that can be uh, also a, a way to differentiate ourselves from from competition um, again this is our um, uh, contact for the different chambers and thanks again for all your time. Uh, wonderful, uh, Frederico, thank you very much. Really appreciate your sharing your presentation with us. Uh, very insightful. <clears throat> and now uh, we move to the questions and answer uh, segment of our, our program uh, this afternoon. And we did have uh, one question that was sent in a little bit early and the question was, what are they looking for with respect to temperature controlled warehouses, proximity to port size of ceiling clearance and et cetera? So I, I think that's a very complicated question. And, and of course it depends, you know, there's different temperatures for every fruit in the world. They all just don't go into one temperature uh, control. I mean, the, the thankful, what, what I'm thankful for, and I think it, it came through in our presentation, there's a tremendous amount of investment in, in cold storage uh, in the Philadelphia region, both from Kopke, Americold, the port, uh, Holt, uh, others and others. And, you know, we have land uh, near Philadelphia, uh, that that's available to develop. There's there's you know capacity for more growth, and that's what we're here uh, uh, to talk about uh, today. So um, I, you know I, I I think would anybody care to elaborate on that uh, question? I'm uh, offered to the panelists. Okay, uh, if there's no uh, nobody, yeah, Sean, 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 could you kind of restate the question as to Sure, Leo. Leo, the or question the context. was. Yeah, I'm sorry. The question was, what are they looking for? And I don't know who, who they would be, but uh, looking for respect to uh, temperature control warehouses. Uh, so I guess it's the customer. What what is the customer really looking for in a temperature control warehouse proximity to the port, uh, size and clearance of ceilings? So. Okay. So should I speak in Spanish or English? How does the translator have me? I think you can do it in. Spanish. Okay. Entonces, por nuestro punto de vista. Y okay. Yo creo... Our viewpoint then, and everybody in the region, including Mr. Ryan, we're all wanting a team, a really expert team with great expertise. We want modern, updated facilities ready to welcome our cargo. And all of us look towards have, having being able to treat to provide cold storage because if that, there's a failure during the trip that's a problem and besides we want the vicinity close to highways and other opportunities for land uh, transport those are the important the major factors when you're looking to find a warehouse fortunately and thanks to the investment made regionally all of us on the delaware river can provide it fortunately okay thank you leo uh, really appreciate uh, you know your comments there We'll move on to the uh, next question. The question uh, is, what is the difference uh, of between uh, the port of Philadelphia, Philiport, comparing to, to that of uh, Fort Lauderdale and Miami? Well, I'll just start by saying I love to visit Miami. It's a great place, especially in the wintertime. I think it's important to point out, though, <clears throat> um, you know, the, the most economical to, way to move fruit is by ocean-going vessel. And if you can move that fruit or your product to the heart of the market uh, most efficiently, I think um, it's it's the best way to go. Um, the market that Philiport sits in, the Port of Philadelphia, <coughs> excuse me, sits right in the middle of the richest consumer market in the world, from Virginia all the way up to Boston. Servicing that market directly, um, I, I don't think anybody would argue is 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 the wrong way to go as far as servicing Miami does have cold, some cold storage and some capabilities. Um, but, but I'll point out that, you know, just by the presentations given today, when you look at all the investment of everybody that's participated just in the panel, and there's others, uh, it, it, it doesn't, Miami and Fort Lauderdale doesn't compare to what we have in the infrastructure in the Port of Philadelphia. 
Um, Sean, if I may add too. Yeah. Um, so in my presentation, I also address the market. So um, in the, the Port of Philadelphia and our facility, uh, we can get to a third of the U.S. population uh, within a day's uh, transport. So um, that really gives us a, a huge advantage over uh, the ports of Miami. Um, and we also are in close proximity to the Canadian market as well. So um, that really uh, helps to allow the Argentinians to uh, be able to address a, a, a additional country and a much larger market through the Port of Philadelphia. Great, Chris. Thank you. Thank you very John, much. John, if, if I may, if I may, can I add something? Sure, absolutely. Oh, thank you. No, um, basically, I, I work in, in blueberries and lemons, and both of them need to full, uh, fulfill a cold treatment. And uh, we need to, we need to, I mean, we need to have a port that receives that fruit that is north from Baltimore, because if the cold treatment fails, we need to do cold treatment um, north from Baltimore. And Philadelphia has those, those facilities. We can I mean, if the cold treatment failed <clears throat> during the transit time, we can finish that cold treatment in Philadelphia. But we, we don't, we can do that in other ports. Great, it's always great to let the experts speak <laughs> and, and not the, the part-time experts like myself. So thank you, Federico and Chris, thank you very much. Uh, next question is actually directly for uh, Marcelo Adagna. Are you, look, are you looking for more imported volume from Argentina? And, and what do you think is the, the differential value uh, proposition for Argentine fruits in the US market? Bueno. Eh, uh -huh. no... Let's see. As a company, what we seek is to have quality fruit we supply most supermarkets and supermarkets are more and more demanding as to quality. So we try to avoid rejections. Rejections mean money for exporters, they're very costly. So that's why our target is to grow year after year with excellent quality products. That's why we keep working nowadays with the most important renowned companies in Argentina regarding the different fruit. And that's why we want to keep on growing, but with quality. This is a quality growth. And going back to what I said today, the Philly port, Philadelphia port is so important because if there is a temperature issue, we're there very, very quickly solving that issue. And that's what we can do at the Philadelphia port. Thank you. Great, Marcel, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question just relates to uh, what I already mentioned earlier in the presentation. All the presentations from the panelists will be made available, uh, concluding um, the completion of our, our webinar today. Um, and then, the <clears throat> excuse me, the next uh, question is to Christine. What, what is expected? What is expected? What is the expected container availability situation coming for the lemons season? Um, well, of course, as everyone knows right now, um, industry wide, we are having you know equipment and vessel shortages. Well, it is expected to. We're all expecting this um, current situation and climate. Um, to level out and the equipment to become more available. I can say at this time, um, most of our congestion and our shortages are in fact coming from uh, a, the Europe lane of traffic. It, it, it's not so bad. Um, I cannot give a better answer um, because again, the, it, this is just industry-wide and the situation is what it is at this time. Um, but again, you know, Argentinian lanes of traffic aren't so bad as they are from other origin points. Um, I don't know if that really helps answer the question. Um, I wish we had better answers because that would make all of our lives um, much easier to try to move international um, commerce. So I hope that helps. Well, uh, sometimes uh, we don't always have the crystal ball that, uh, that we like. I certainly wish I had in this case for that question in particular. 
Right. Thank, thank you, Christine. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last question, unfortunately, uh, is in uh, Espanol. He doesn't understand it. Uh, yeah, the, the last question is in Spanish, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to uh, butcher the Spanish language, but uh, I don't know, Luis, if, if we care to take that question. Otherwise, I, I translated it as, as question number six. Uh, the decision to reduce the transit times depends on, on the shipping. Uh, how can we work on that? I think this question is for Marcelo specifically. So Marcelo. Okay. Yes. Bueno. Bueno, como no. Hoy, no. Nowadays, the shipping companies that are operating in Argentina go worldwide. But to give you an example, when we send lemon or pears from Argentina towards the East Coast, there's a stopover at Uruguay, then Santos in Brazil, and there's a week delay. And this means a bigger delay in getting there. That's why I mentioned we're, it's taking us 28 to 30 days with something that should be there in 14 days. This forces us to consider an alternative, which would be the a Chilean port, which allows as seven days actually, because it takes four days to get to Chile and then uh, seven days from Chile to the US. So we export as authorities, we need to work with ship owners, brokers, and we need to find a way to cut down on timing, not just for the US, but worldwide. That's how we have to go about it all together. Hey, Sean. Yes, go ahead, Sean. Go ahead, Leo. Uh, uh, por, por ambos, uh, hay, hay, hay dos. Thank you, Sean. It depends on volume and price. Obviously, if we have the volume, ship owners will want to have greater capacity. If the price is profitable, they'll, of course, want and will be able to use greater capacity. In the case of containers, the world is loose handed. I mean, to be able to say that there are empty containers in Asia that should be in California and there are others in Memphis, Tennessee and could be elsewhere. But the thing is, if we want to be consistent in Philadelphia, that is, there is a, a group, a certain volume of container units which are ready to travel wherever there's cargo. And in Argentina, in the River Plate, we say the next three months are full, but today we spent an hour and a half with a new executive boss at MMC, and they've bought 20,000 new containers during the COVID year. Maersk, with their partners in Hamburg South, traditionally the biggest in the, the Rio de la Plata area, they're also focusing on that cargo. The idea then is that the world is getting to a point where the prices are, have, we haven't heard of these prices for several years, but we need these prices for the investments in containers, steamers, and logistics. This is a new world. Lemons, Marcelo, as you mentioned, are cross the Argentine Chilean border and are being shipped by MSCC through or the uh, Chilean ports. So me, this means that the supply chain is working well and they're ready to support this next year. Oh, that's the idea, volume, price, and a trade world, a world of trade. We need the capacity to address it. 
Well, yeah, thank you, Leo. Uh, thank you for your comments. And I think that brings us actually to the end of our program today. I don't see any other uh, questions. And I just wanna thank all the panelists um, for their participation today. Elliot Ortiz, Leo Holt, Chris Ryan, uh, Frederico, uh, Christine Stanton and Marcella Dagna. We had a real brain trust uh, from, from the Philadelphia supply chain community today. And I, for one, uh, learned, learned a lot. And thanks to our friends from the Argentine Embassy, particularly His Excellency Ambassador Arguello and Under Secretary Sabori. Um, and particular thanks uh, to Maria Luz uh, Peraya and uh, Dominic O'Brien and, and my staff, uh, Peter and Amanda. And uh, please, all everybody, you're most welcome in the Port of Philadelphia. Please, you know, come visit us sometime. We look forward to seeing you. We look forward to working with you and growing the trade uh, between Argentina and Philadelphia. And now we've come to the end of the webinar and thank you very much for your friendship and the relationship and for participating in this event and look forward to a bright future. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Buenas tardes, adios todos. Thank you very much. Gracias.